Okay, good afternoon. We have 12 o'clock right on the dot. Uh, and so thank you so much everyone for joining us uh, over your lunch hour today, if it is your lunch hour. Uh, welcome to uh, our very first um, retirement planning webinar. So we're excited to partner today with Avisa Wealth Management uh, and you know share these highly educational retirement webinars with our Connexus members and Thrive clients, as well as many of em uh, employees who have chosen to join us today. So I'll introduce myself to start. I am your host. My name is Amy Poole, and I'm the Director of Retail and Small Business Banking with Connexus Credit Union. Uh, and I will also introduce our presenter who's going to spend some time with us today. So we are going to hear from um, Doug Carroll today. And so uh, Doug is the tax and estate specialist with Avisa Wealth, who is a wealth management partner to credit unions across Canada. Um, he previously ran an estate law, uh, sorry, estate planning law practice and was an advanced case consultant with a life insurer and mutual fund provider. So Doug also holds a business degree and a master of law uh, specializing in tax and is qualified as a certified financial planner and a trust and estate practitioner. So he's been doing this for 25 plus years now and supporting our financial advisors from written articles, which we can leverage as employees, to individual case consultations, uh, and of course, webcasts like today. So we thank very much. We thank you, Doug, very much for joining us and taking the time to educate us all today. Uh, before I just turn it over to you really quickly, I will inform the group that uh, the webinar is being recorded uh, and I will now pass it over to you, Doug, to kick us off. Okay, then I'm going to take control. I'm going to share up my screen or a part of my screen here. And uh, there we go. Uh, just uh, let me know that we're good. And it's up there. We are and, good, yes. Okay, so I will uh, click on this. There we go. I just want to keep my, my screen on so that I can see you if you wave at me wildly and say, we can't see you, we can't hear you. <laughs> I just want to make sure that I keep it up there if I can here. And I'm going to talk about this, uh, this talk about a topic of uh, retirement readiness, <clears throat> which is the front end of, uh, of using tax sheltered plans for retirement savings. And I say that as uh, the front end as it's the uh, earlier in life savings mode that you will be in at this point or looking at it in terms of you or those around you or those you consult with as the uh, the place where you are in the accumulation phase of things looking towards the back end when you'll draw things down which would be a combination of taking that rsp and converting it over into a decumulation uh, type of uh, connected vehicle like a registered retirement income fund or a registered annuity or just making withdrawals and then there'll be other considerations on the back end of things of uh, what else you might have whether it's public pensions that you would be triggering at the appropriate ages or other types of assets that you might have accumulated wealth in like uh, investment real estate uh, anything that uh, that is going to support your later years but our focus here is on the uh, the rsp the front end of things and i'll take you through a number of the uh, uh, topics here i commonly have well, well, maybe one or two extra slides beyond what it is that I have as the numbered pieces here. I think pretty much it is just these that, that I have. There won't be much more text, if any, on any of these slides beyond what you're looking at here other than some images that, uh, that help carry the, uh, the, the particular point that I'm, I'm making at that, uh, at that time. And as Amy was saying, if you've got any questions that, um, that come to mind, if there's something critical and you throw it into the chat or the Q&A and uh, Amy sees it, then she might flag me down and say, hold on a second, uh, that didn't make sense, or there's a big gap there, or whatever it might be, then I'm happy to deal with them at that point. But otherwise, just for the sake of the, the flow of things, we'll, we'll just uh, do it as a continuous thread that I'll, I'll walk you through, and then we'll, uh, we'll be happy to take uh, questions and, uh, and discuss things at the end of, uh, of the bulk of the content that I have here. So with that, that aside, I'll, uh, I'm not going to read off these things. You can read as well as I can. So these are the names of the slides that are coming up. So I'll just uh, go with it now. And I, I like to start to, to look at this from, from an age perspective because we, we certainly do have culturally a uh, 
a connection with 65. When I do these kinds of sessions in, in person, which I don't do as often as I did <laughs> for the last 20 years or so, actually, since I've been doing this 25 plus, I was just thinking, oh, I have to change that to about 30 because when I count back in time, I, I was at it in the, uh, the mid to early 90s. Um, <clears throat> so uh, the, uh, the, the kind of cultural connection we have with 65, I would poll people and say, what do you think 65 is supposed to mean here? And obviously it's, it's retirement age with quotes around it that uh, people might be looking at. And, and why, do we, why do we think 65? Why do we, we believe 65? It's partly because as uh, people like to, uh, to give you the, the history of it, that the earliest of the public pension programs that were put in place in Germany was based on age 65, which is actually wrong. It was actually based on age 70 when it was put in place back in around 1880, somewhere in that uh, give or take uh, 10 year uh, time frame. And then once they got over into the uh, the 20th century, then it was moved down to 65. But it, it, it has been the lock for the age that we tend to think of in terms of uh, retirement related to the fact that those public pensions were introduced on on that basis and uh, the thing about it is is that nobody nobody was told at least <laughs> not not recently is told you're 65 you can't work anymore there there was actually that as ageism that was built into the structure of our uh, our legal system at one point but that's gone you don't have to retire at 65. You're not forced to. You're you're not forced to continue to work until 65. But we do continue to think of this as uh, as a as a target, and that's that's in part it structurally because the the public pensions that we in Canada have are still based on uh, age 65 as being one of the, the the thresholds that determines how much you're going to receive for your public pension. So you can't start your old age security until age 65. And with the Canada Pension Plan, old age security being based on trying to alleviate from poverty was the original rationale for the uh, uh, old age security. But it, it is really just based on you being a resident in Canada that you get that. Whereas the Canada Pension Plan is something which is set up as an insurance-based plan where you contribute into that based on your working income and your working years, which then effectively buys you a pension, which has the quote, normal retirement date, which is the phrase that uh, does attach to it, of 65, but you can take it as early as age 60 and as late as age 70. The number that we tend to latch on to, though, is this uh, this age 65 that um, that might attach to retirement. Again, you're not compelled to do that. The 86 that follows behind that is life expectancy. This is a few years old. I should probably update this. It might be 87 now, but it's life expectancy when you are 65 years of age. What is your life expectancy? And this is the the uh, male or female. It doesn't break down based on your health condition. Women do live longer than men, so the uh, women's number is probably closer to eighty. see across the world and it was back in 2007 that I came across this number and uh, it was it was a much larger study uh, at that point and it was saying that children who were born that year had a life expectancy of 104. There were some qualifiers to that. I think that was their life expectancy if they hit 65 then would be 104 but quite an amazing thing that uh, you have a life expectancy for the bulk of the population who were born 15 or so years ago will be over a century, very different than where things were uh, at an earlier point in time. Now, all those numbers aside, the idea that you you uh, may be going to retire exactly at 65 does not mean that you need to save towards a retirement which will last for 21 years because life expectancy as it's commonly used means that half of the people in the cohort will live 
two, but no further than the target uh, time, and the other half will live beyond that. So half the people will be dead at 86, and the other half will continue to live. If you plan your retirement based on 86 and 86 alone, then hopefully you're dead because you don't have enough money to take you beyond age 86. So it's not that simple to just say, oh, I need to multiply the number of uh, of years that I expect against the dollars I have, and that'll tell me how much I need to save. It's more complicated, and that's why working with a financial advisor is something that will help the average person who doesn't spend their every day doing this get a better picture of what they need to accumulate. So you're looking about about in retirement. Even today, uh, you've got people who are are looking at uh, 40 years of retirement. I uh, my 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 parents, uh, my dad died earlier this year at the beginning of the year. He was 98 and a half. So he was in retirement for uh, for 40, for roughly 40 years, and uh, and that's somebody who was born back in the 1920s. So it's it's not unusual that we see people who are nearing or hitting triple digits even now, and that's going to be the case on an ongoing basis. So we've got the people here. I think the majority of the people here will be in their working years, and uh, and them themselves or yourselves, myself, we we expect that we're going to have. Uh, a, couple or a few decades in retirement, our own children, though, could be looking at a decade or more beyond what it is that we are looking at, which then reinforces why it is that financial literacy, financial education, retirement education is is very important for the current population, but especially for the next generation, because the health system has allowed for us to live longer, but it hasn't necessarily made us smarter to manage money. That's why we have to focus our attention on it from time to time. So uh, there's some numbers to uh, to work with. The other part about retirement uh, is that we are uh, living longer. Life expectancy back at the turn of the century, and you have to be careful in saying that. Everyone's used that, used that phrase all the time. But when, when we say turn of the century, turn of the century actually means 2000, not 1900. But whenever I think of turn of the century, I think 1900 as the as the phrase is used. And when you look back all the way to the 1900s, or 1900 itself, at, the, at that turn of century, life expectancy was in the, uh, in the high 40s or low 50s, which can be a misrepresentative term because some huge things happened in that first few uh, decades, couple of decades, and then, and then uh, as we continued on through the 20th century, we had significant uh, improvement in child mortality, we had significant improvement in women dying in childbirth in that first 10, 15 years of the 1900s. So that number of 49 or 51, 52, depending on which jurisdiction you're looking at, is really kind of misrepresentative if you're not careful about it. I'm not a demographer myself, but it's kind of misrepresentative of the potential that anyone had to live into their 70s, 80s, or 90s, that once you get past child mortality, if you got past uh, or up to age 10, then you had a life expectancy not unlike what it is today. And particularly if you got up to age 65, life expectancy is not materially different now than it was 100 or so years ago. So we, we certainly are living longer, no question about it. And, and we're, we're also living differently. There, there may be that there were people who went through hard physical labor kind of working years where their bodies were worn out and they, they finished off work and then went and sat on a rocking chair on their porch, lasted six months, and then they were done. I actually know a friend, a friend of mine, where uh, her father, yeah, her father, he he had six months in retirement, and uh, and he died six months later. And the mother now, I know how old she is. She's well into her 80s, uh, late 80s now. <laughs> and so uh, she's living well into it. Uh, he had a very brief retirement, and uh, she's continued on. So uh, the idea, though, that, that we will sit on a rocking chair or whatever, be totally sedate and will will not uh, will not have things to do. It just doesn't apply anymore. We're, we're living longer. We're living in a different way. Some people are planning outright that they are going to reserve the time that they're going to do some some substantial amount of those fun things like longer travel, more deep 
uh, engagement and those things until they get into their retirement years and perhaps are conceding on the opportunities they might have during their younger years so that they can use that money and that time in those later years to enjoy that time. So it, it may very well be that they'll have more fun ahead of them by intention in their retirement years. But the other part of it is that we're gonna have more time when we are in decline. So what that means for us is that yes, the, uh, the, the health system has done a lot for us to, to extend lives, but it, it's extended lives without necessarily improving how we are able to live in those later years. Some conditions, medical conditions that uh, people have had, whether it's uh, an acute condition or, uh, or a chronic condition, some conditions might have been effectively a death sentence for people even a few decades ago, you know, three, four decades ago. There, there are so many medical advances that have allowed people to have day surgery for things that may very well have been it's my phrase that I got to get use of very well. <laughs> I've been saying that in the last few days. If I call myself out, or I'll stop doing it. Uh, but uh, they may be things that during uh, during the uh, 50s, 60s, and 70s would have meant that somebody would have spent days or weeks in hospital that might be day surgery. Uh, my sister, <laughs> not now, I got a number of sisters, but my sister uh had uh, some uh, some stomach pains uh, some ab abdominal pains and literally went to hospital early in the day after it had been bothering her the last couple of days and it was an appendicitis and it was taken care of and she was back home that same day uh, that that was about a year or two ago that uh, that that happened can you imagine that when you were a child that the idea that you would have what would have been you know, physical surgery with, with uh, an open scar turns into a small slit and uh, uh, they take care of it with all the mechanical parts of things. So we need to be thinking about how we are accumulating our, our money, but then what we are accumulating it for that we have enough to live a um, a fulsome life in our later years, which we call our, our retirement years. So funding the fund, but also funding the, the decline that we have will mean that we need to have money so that we will live in a reasonable way in those later years when we do need support services of one sort or another. Whether that is uh, devices that we need, whether it is people as personal support workers, whether it is something that is going to be a renovation in uh, the place where we live, or it's a long-term care facility, uh, long-term care being the, the nursing home care as we know it historically, but there, there's a whole range of ways that you can move from where you are now to where you're going to be, where there are different levels of support or just a connection to the opportunity to, to engage in a a way that uh, that allows you to live reasonably in uh, in the skin that you're in and in the place where you are at the time when you get into those later years. And then the final thing here to touch on is that some of us may be in a sandwich generation where, and, and particularly now, you, you have the potential that it's not just a matter of saying, oh, I've got grandparents who are living. You could have great grandparents or great great grandparents. You, you have the potential that there will be four or five generations of a, a family, much more so. It could have happened in the past occasionally, but now it's much more likely that you're going to have multi generations living at the same time. And whether that's your parents, your, your own parents, parents or it's your aunts and uncles or somebody further in distance both up or off to the side in terms of the relationship some of us are, have a responsibility whether it's a, a a moral responsibility which we feel or compelled upon or just something which we take on to take care of those generations above, as well as our own children. Our own children may take longer time to get into their, their productive years because schooling tends to last longer. So how do you how do you carry the kids, carry the parents, carry the grandparents? And, and I'll tell you, I'm not a woman, uh, but women do tend to carry that much more so than men. Unfair that that, that may be, it does tend to be that women carry that more. So when you are doing your your general financial planning, when you're doing your retirement planning, the way that you approach it and your expectation of how long you're going to live and how you're going to spend your time should be informed by the family you have around you, the, the actual people, but also the change in, uh, in the length of time that people are going to be living 
can have more impact on women than can have on men. As I say, it's unfair, but it, it is something that you, you, you can whine about it being unfair, but you can't change whether or not you have the money. You need to know ahead of time that you have planned appropriately for you so that you can live in the way that you want to. So well, let me, uh, again, some, some uh, groundwork before I get into any numbers, and I'm not going to put you through human calculator syndrome here. I just want to, uh, to lay out the, uh, the groundwork of what we're looking at, and then I'll give you some of the numbers associated with it and, and talk about some of the tax features, particularly of RSPs, because that's what the topic is about, is retirement readiness with RSPs. I'll talk about some of the, the, uh, the tax features beyond just the, hey, I can take a deduction for it kind of uh, comment. That's one of the things, but it breaks out a little bit more so you can parse it down. It doesn't change the fact that it's doing those things underneath, but it's nice to look at the, the components of how it gives you your tax breaks. So when you're... Um, when you're looking at your your financial planning, financial planning being the big the big picture, sometimes people will equate whether they vocalize it or have it in their back of their minds when they hear the phrase financial planning. If they're not that familiar with it, they might equate it with oh that's investments or that's that's budgeting. Financial planning is the big picture, and both investments and uh, and budgeting are parts of doing that. I think of it more in terms of personal economics, where you are, are looking at all the financial aspects of your, your life through the life cycle itself, including the transfer of property, because financial is, is a representation of value of property. So the transfer of your property as estate planning, which can happen during your life or can happen at death, I don't equate estate planning being a will, it is going through all the thought process of who do I want to take care of, who must I take care of, and how am I going to take care of them, which comes back to the property that I have available to take care of them. And when I say take care of them, you have to think of yourself along with that. So take care, take care of yourself first, then taking care of the other people around you. My definition of estate planning is take care, care of yourself now and in the future and take care of the people around you now and in the future and when you're no longer around. And that's really important. It's that classic thing that we have as an analogy of when you're on an airplane and the, the, uh, um, the masks drop down and you get some turbulence, then put your own mask on first so that you're in position to put the mask on the children or whoever it is that you're taking care of. So you really do need to take care of yourself first in terms of your finances, be aware of what you have before you are able to then take care of those other people. It does mean that you do have to have some notion of what budgeting is. Whether, just like dieting, it's not going to change whether you have a budget that you don't pay attention to it. It still is your budget. It's, it's where the source of your monies are, what they go into and where you spend it. Likewise, with a diet, it, it tends to be equated with, well, I'm, I'm reducing down what I'm eating or I'm increasing what I'm eating if I'm bodybuilding of some sort. Uh, it doesn't change whether you have a diet or have a budget, whether you pay attention to it, but you do have a better opportunity to make best use of it if you are clear on what the needs are that you have and the means or the sources where you're going to draw from in order to apply or take care of those needs. So what we wanna do is we wanna take present you in terms of your income earning capacity, whether you're doing that with your brains or you do it with mind or muscle, whether you do it with your brains or you're doing it with your, your uh, hands, your physical part of things or a combination of the two is what everybody does. Taking present you to take care of future you. The difference is that future you, with some small exceptions to uh, uh, some some aspect maybe of, uh, of part-time work you might do for engagement, perhaps to make some ends meet, you, you are for the most part only money at that time that is taking care of you. Present you has the, the, the physical and the mental capability to work and to earn income. Future you depends on the money that you set aside, which then provides the income for you when you are no longer or no longer interested in being in an active income earning position. So I'll touch on, on some tax principles here before I get into uh, the numbers. I, mean, I think I'm probably scaring some people who, who get nervous about numbers, but I'm not getting into deep numbers. It's, it really is important to, to understand 
some principles that will will give you both uh, comfort as well as impetus to to make sure that you've uh, you've done what you need to do in order to take care of yourself and those people around you. So that's why I'm talking more in principles here before I talk a little bit about the numbers. So one of the the things that I, I like to uh, bring up, which is a really basic point, maybe, is is to understand the difference between what you earn and what you spend. I think that if we polled again, if we're in person, I could say how many of you, without saying the number out loud, how many of you know how much you earn? Whatever you want to look at in terms of how you earn, that could be how much you earn in a year, how much you earn per hour or per week or whatever it might be. You have a notion of that. But how much you spend is not really front of mind for the majority of people. And what you have to be careful about is you you or we, we see all sorts of, of ads coming at us, whether or not we want them to come at us. It used to be that, that you turn the TV on and then you saw commercials coming at you. Now, just being on your phone and uh, and checking something out means that the uh, the phone knows that you uh, you looked at lumber and therefore you got a whole bunch of things being shot at you. And after about two weeks of you really need a new hammer, you find yourself waking up in the morning and going, I think I'll go shop for hammers. Uh, so you spend with your after tax money. The difference between the two, of course, the taxes that you pay, is 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 quite important. You you again need to have an appreciation, not not a human calculator type of thing, but an appreciation that budgeting will help you to get comfort that you are are in decent shape, that you're not going to be in difficult position by keeping focused on your after-tax money available to spend on the things that you have available. Now, there's two concepts that I want to distinguish or two, two aspects of tax that I want to distinguish here marginal tax rate and average tax rate. So our tax system, our, our personal income tax system is a graduated tax bracket system, which means that as you earn higher levels of income, you pay a higher rate of tax on that next level of income. And that applies both provincially and federally that you have tax brackets and then the two come together and you've got, depending on province, somewhere between uh, eight and 12 uh, brackets as you go up in, uh, in income level. Marginal tax rate is the tax that you pay on your next dollar of income that you earn or it's on the margin. So it's the next or the last dollar, the, the most recent dollar, either way you want to look at it. It's what you're paying at the, at the top level. <clears throat> when you are saving for your, your future, and particularly where you're saving an RSP, and I'll give you a graphic on this. You are saving based on marginal tax rate. You are taking dollars that otherwise are at the high level, the marginal brackets, and you're putting them over towards savings. Now, distinguish that from average tax rate. Average tax rate is taking all that your ta taxes are, and I'm only talking income taxes here, uh, all the taxes that you have divided by your gross income, and that will tell you what your average tax rate is. When you draw off your retirement income, and specifically when you draw off of RRSPs as a source, which would then become a registered retirement income fund or a registered uh, annuity payment, that effectively is being taxed at average tax rates as you draw that out in your later years. Now, that, that's a, a, a real generalization of how that comes out, but I'll show you what I mean by that in, uh, in, in just a minute. The the spending that you do in your, your later years will be based on having drawn out money at average tax rates. So let's look here about, about where the numbers stand. I just I actually I updated this uh, just yesterday. I, I normally have the numbers on here in the current year, but we're so close to the end of this year, uh, to the end of 2023. I thought I'd, I'd put in the 2024 numbers and, in, and down below we've got the uh, the 2023 numbers anyway as uh, as uh, past reference. So with, uh, with RSPs, the current room that we have available in RSPs, the way that RSP room is calculated, it is based on your working income, your earned income. And when I say it's based on working income, it, it, earned income actually does include some things that are not uh, traditionally perhaps considered to be earning income. Then the, the one main one is that where you have rental income, your net rental income is part of what is used to calculate your RSP room. For the majority 
of the population. It is your earned income being employment income. So it's 18% of the preceding year's earned income up to a legislated maximum, which indexes from year to year. So the, the, the maximum that is happening for 2024, so that's next year, the maximum amount of room is $31,560. The current year here in 2023, you see down below, the current figure, I have to take a look at it now, it's $30,780. And you can see in each case, you'll hit that figure as the maximum once your income is around about $170,000 or so. That's 18% of, of that figure gives you the, uh, the room that's available. So that's RRSPs. Tax-free savings accounts, because uh, this is something that uh, sometimes is played off or compared against one another. Should I put money into an RSP or a TFSA? Tax-free savings accounts really need to be clearly distinguished from RSP room, one in terms of the, the calculation of how much, but also in terms of the, the tax world that it exists in. RSPs are pre-tax figures, which is another way to say when you put money into an RSP, you get a deduction. Whereas a tax-free savings account, when you put money into a TFSA, you are, are putting in after-tax money, or again, the other way to say it is you don't get a tax deduction when you put money into a TFSA. However, with an RSP, when you draw the money out, it is taxable. With the TFSA, there is no tax applying. So both of them have an event or a point at which there is tax applying. With the RSP, it happens on the way out. With the TFSA, it happens before it goes in. And in both case, you have tax sheltering on the inside for both RSP and RIF structures. One of the really interesting things that's happened, as, <laughs> if you can say interesting, because you got to have a positive look at that, what's going on with the crazy inflation that we've been seeing. But the, one of the really things that we've seen happen over the course of the last two years is the TFSA room has bumped up significantly. I remember back in 2009 or 2008 when it was introduced, everyone, or not everyone, but a lot of people were, were saying, oh, who cares? It's 5,000 bucks. It's, it's nothing. It's 5,000 bucks. And I think that was a, a misunderstanding in part, maybe people just trying to, to voice something and taking a, a, a position of, of a, a, a voice on, on an issue, perhaps, that, uh, that they wanted to uh, show that they, they have a concern. But... Uh, first thing is this difference between the nature of the, the room. TFSA room is expressed as an after-tax figure. So you can't say, oh, you get 7,000 of, uh, of TFSA room, but you get 31,000 of RSP room. Nobody said you had to do one or the other. It's a new thing that, that was made available. It was made at 5,000 originally back when it started in 2009, and it was an after-tax figure. So if you wanted to equate this to what it would have been in a world where you just uh, you converted the the two to to exist as an equivalent availability for savings, then instead of the TFSA, if they had just said, "Hey, you can have more RSP room," then to reverse out the seven thousand as it is right now, you divide by one minus a person's marginal tax rate, which means that at, at a fifty percent tax bracket, this seven thousand dollar figure is actually the the equivalent notionally of having fourteen thousand dollars more of RSP room, and if you have one person who is the income earner or the primary income earner in a household, then that's the source of the cash, which is available to go into RSP or TFSA. Two people who are spouses, each of which have 7,000, so that's 14,000, divide that by 50%, that's like having $28,000 in the, the equivalent of RSP room. I mean, I'm not actually giving anybody or taking any money myself and doing this, it's just room, it's just a concept, but really, that, that is, is significant in, in a comparison with the RRSP availability that you have. I'm not suggesting, again, that you do one or the other or that it changes exactly what the figures are, $7,000 of room that exists for TFSA, but, uh, but it, it is uh, something which, which is fairly significant. 
the figure started at 5,000 back in 2009, and it indexes on a different kind of uh, uh, basis than RSP room. Anyone who's been a worker for any period of time would know that RSP room, the, the background uh, prescribed limit, it goes up from year to year. And that's why it's a it's an odd figure. It's not a it's not a round figure like the, the TFSA, which is a, a five hundred dollar amount uh, that it, it goes up by. With the TFSA, there is an underlying reference figure which is being indexed using the same factor as applies to RSPs, which also applies to our tax brackets, for example, uh, that uh, index on that basis. And what happened was back in 2012, a, a year ago, I guess it was, back in the fall of 2023, we had that really, really hefty inflation. And the underlying reference figure was just below the point where it would average out to push it up to the next 500. So once it goes, uh, rounds out to, to the next uh, 500 figure, then the room goes up by $500. So it was just below $6,250, the reference figure. And then we had over 6% inflation in the 12 months leading up to September of 2022, which is with where the index factor is applied. So we had a very significant jump in the index factor, which pushed us from 6,000 of uh, TFSA room in 2022 to 6,500 this year. And then the most recent figure had to be a touch over 3%, which obviously it was, in order to go up to the next figure of 7,000. So we've gone from six to 7,000 of available room, not cash, that we can make use of from two years ago until coming into next year. So I just wanted to give you a little bit of the, the background on that, that TFSA room is that much larger now uh, coming into next year than it was two years ago. And it becomes that much more of a consideration once you get a significant amount in your RSP savings that you might look at having the TFSA being a, uh, a, a coordinated component of how you, you accumulate the money. So side by side, here's the RSP and the TFSA. Like I said, there's three event time periods, funding, growth, and withdrawal from either of the two plans. With the RSP, you get that pre-tax uh, deductible contribution. With the TFSA, you get uh, uh, the after-tax money going in. So you had your tax hit before you got to participate in the plan, but then there's no tax that applies thereafter as you're drawing money out of the TFSA. And the question that commonly comes up is, how, how should I decide between these two? And the general answer is, you will do both. For near-term uses, the TFSA makes a heck of a lot more sense than using the RSP. But if you're going to be in a lower tax bracket when you draw the money out of this particular bit of savings, then RSP makes the, the most sense to put the money into. If you're going to be in a higher tax bracket later, or again, if you need the money sooner than uh, years or decades out in the future to fund your non-working years, then the TFSA is going to be the better way to go about it. If you're at exactly the same tax bracket at the later withdrawal as you are at the contribution time, then it doesn't matter whether you use the RSP and the TFSA, but that's a little bit of an academic exercise. It, it, you're, you're going to be at higher or lower, and I would think of it more in terms of the what we're talking about here about retirement readiness, that you want to focus your, your main attention on accumulating in your RSP and then supplementing that if you're in a, in a really nice position, the investments have done well in your RSP, you're getting close to the point where you're about to, to stop working, that maybe you skew more of your attention towards putting money into TFSA because you have sufficient to take care of the bulk of your income in your retirement years through your RSP savings. And then your TFSA gives you the opportunity to do those, uh, those more discretionary extra trips here and there uh, during the course of those, uh, those retirement years. So uh, as I said, there's, there's more places that you can save than just in, uh, in RSPs. In fact, I want to put that up a, a variety of places where money might end up. RSP is the accumulating asset, the accumulating uh, program 
that allows you to take a tax deduction going in. There is a maximum amount that can go into an RSP. And then when you get to the point where you're drawing that money out, you can cash out the RSP. And if you if you cash out the entire thing, then you're taxable on all of it at one point in time. And that's not likely going to be a good idea because if it's any significance to the value, it's going to push you up through brackets. So usually what people will do is they'll convert over from the RSP to a RIF, a registered retirement income fund, as between the two, the RSP, as I said, has a maximum that can go into it. The RIF has a minimum that must come out of it every year, and it's based on your age. So, but they both have their constraints. The uh, the RIF is usually the way that people will tend to go, but you also have the possibility that you can purchase an annuity from an insurance company that will take the the investment decision making out of your hands because you're you're paying the the insurance company to then pay you an annual amount every single year, usually paid monthly actually, but it's based on annual payments that uh, that the insurance company will pay you for you having given them a lump sum, which was originally sourced from RSP. It may be that you decide I, I'm, I'm okay with being taxed on some of my RSP right now. So I'll take some as cash. I'll put some into RIF and just for the security or the comfort that I'm going to have a consistent level of income, I might buy a registered annuity, which will then pay out for me over the course of the time. And as each of those payments are made from the registered annuity, I'm taxable on those things. Now, I already mentioned the tax-free savings account and its distinction from uh, RSPs. We also have registered pension plans, which are workplace plans that employers will contribute into for us as employees. They, they share the same tax limits as RSPs in terms of how much can be accumulated into them or, or contributed into them. There is more arithmetic going on with, uh, with registered pension plans in coordination with RSPs, but the, uh, the overall limit to being able to put as much as you want into them is, is uh, constrained by the tax rules. So you don't have an unlimited openness to, uh, to things. We also have in those later years, as I mentioned, the possibility and the likelihood that we will have payments coming from public pensions. That would be the Canada Pension Plan as the, uh, uh, the employment-based insurance plan that we contribute premiums into and then draw out of in our later years. Old age security, as I mentioned, is, is based on your residency in Canada. If you are resident in Canada for 40 years after the age of 18, then you will get the full OAS amount starting at age 65, although you can defer it as late as age 70 and you get a little premium for each month that you delay. Of course, you're not getting any money out of it on those months that you're not taking it, but then when you do take it, you get a larger amount as it begins. And depending on you and your other sources and your life expectancy, you may want to delay either that, the old age security, or in the case of the Canada Pension Plan, Again, 65 is the, the target, quote, normal retirement date, but you can take as early as age 60 and you take a reduction if you take before age 60, or if you wait on each month after age 65 birth uh, a year, birth date, then you get a premium on, on top of that. So it's, it's not simple to make the decision, but you do have a lot of opportunities or places that are available to you. You also have accumulation of value in your home. Uh, I, I do think of, uh, personally, I think of the home as being a specialized type of savings. You can rent. Uh, there's nothing wrong with renting. Many people rent for their whole lives. We've got this cultural belief that the pinnacle of being successful with your money is to own a home. And I'm not going to say that, that there isn't a great feeling of satisfaction that you own a property, but you've devoted a significant amount of your capital towards owning that property beyond what the cost is to live in that property. If you rent, then you'd have excess money beyond what is needed to purchase a property that could go into other savings. And some people do it that way very effectively. You don't have to own it. Uh, it's something that is a lifestyle decision in a lot of cases because you want to remain in the same community and have control as well as being a financial decision. And once you own your property, you might be quite settled and you want to age in place in that, uh, that property, which might require some kind of uh, renovations in order for that to happen, particularly if there's a lot of stairs, 
or if there's uh, th there's small bathrooms that are not very maneuverable, uh, it may be that you decide you're going to downsize. You're going to sell that property and move into a smaller one. Use the difference in the money that's available to then assist with your retirement savings uh, or your, your retirement income or to make renovations to the new property to make it a more accommodating to you. And then as far as other real estate, you may have to... Uh, uh, available to you some uh, investment real estate that you then can use to um, to draw income from rental income and perhaps sell off and then you get a pot of money from that. You can also invest in non-registered accounts, ones that are not tax sheltered under the Income Tax Act, like RSPs, RIFs, TFSAs, et cetera. And if you have a business, then you might continue on owning the business, which pays you dividends in your later years, or you might sell it off and get a, a splash of cash that comes from selling that business, which again becomes property that is available to you. When I say property, property is anything you can own. Sometimes when you say the word property, th people think real estate. There's real property and there's personal property, cash and uh, your uh, your pair of jeans and your uh, your TV and your iPhone. That that is personal property. It's movable property as opposed to real estate. So there's a variety of places where you might have income sources, depending on how you've accumulated, how you've run your life. Now, I said I was going to talk a, a little bit about the tax drivers. This is one of those articles that we'll share with you subsequent to the uh, the program here. And, and I just want to touch on the uh, on on these five different components of where you get savings, tax savings with RSPs. So commonly people will say, I want to get a deduction. And that might be the driving force. And that's fine. As long as it gets you saving, then that's good to, to get money into RSPs so that you get the savings. So when you make a contribution into RSP, it is what I say is pre-tax money, which means that when you make a contribution into it, then you get a deduction when you file your taxes for that year, you were able to claim a deduction for the amount that you, you put in. The benefit of doing that, apart from getting the deduction, is there are more dollars to be invested. If you're having after-tax money, you'd have your, your money that goes in, and let's say that you're at the 40% tax bracket, you can put money into RSP, and $100 is, is $100 being invested in the RSP. You get a $100 deduction in your current year for having done that. If instead you were to put money into a TFSA as an after-tax amount, then the $100 would have been taxed. If your marginal tax rate is 40%, then you're going to end up with $60 that gets invested in the TFSA. So you have more money being invested in an RSP than would otherwise be the case if you allowed yourself to be taxed on that money. You're investing larger amounts of dollars by doing that. Now, with the TFSA, remember, the amounts coming out of it are non-taxable. So that's not the end of the story, the fact that there is more investable in an RSP than, a, than in a TFSA. But it's part of the consideration of where you want to have your money accumulating. So you're investing more dollars, you're investing the uh, the pre-dollars and uh, pre-tax dollars, and then you get sheltered earnings inside the RSP, same as with the TFSA, but let's stick with the RSP. When you have earnings from year to year, you're not taxed on them, whether it's a change in the price of the, the securities that you hold, whether that's individual securities or it's uh, mutual funds, those things as they go up and down in value, hopefully more up than down, those things are not taxed by the change in their value. And when they pay interest or dividends, you're not taxed as long as those things remain inside there. So you're not being uh, being uh, nickeled and dimed in a sense with the in income that's earned on a year to year basis. It continues to be a larger amount continuing to be invested. And what that does for you in terms of compounding the reinvestment of the income is that you end up with larger amounts being reinvested from the larger amount that was originally invested with the RSP. And then finally, when you take the money out of an RSP, then you are taxed on the draw that you're com that's coming out of it. But the likelihood and, and the certainty for many people is that they will be at a lower tax bracket in those later years than when the contribution was made. Structurally, tax-wise, if you are making contributions and you get a deduction from your marginal tax bracket, your highest tax bracket, and then when you draw out, it's part of your bulk of income, which is subject to average tax rates, then those of you who are mathematicians will know marginal tax bracket always is higher than average tax bracket. So you're almost always better off to be making use of an RSP to a certain extent than to take money out and be taxed on a year-to-year -year basis 
and then uh, fund your retirement on that basis. Tax-free savings account, though, definitely gives some relief on that where you are taking after-tax money and you're investing that part of your money. Again, one of the articles that we've got gives, gets into this in a little bit more detail. So I'll sum it up here. Uh, we've got uh, uh, three things that are happening. We are shifting, we're shelting, and we're shifting. So if we look at it this, uh, this way, this is a representation of our graduated tax bracket system, where each of the levels that I've got showing here are low, middle, high. There's actually multiple brackets. It's just a representation, obviously. And we've got our working years, which I've grouped up to say, hey, if you've got uh, a 20 year time period uh, uh, for each of these blocks, then you might spend 40 years in retirement, 20 and 20, and then 20 or 20 in your working years, and then 20 as your retirement years. If you don't save towards your later years, then it's a mystery how you're gonna live in those later years. So we're shifting money by taking a deduction of the dollars, which are otherwise at a top bracket level, and we're putting those over into RSP. We got the tax sheltering happening inside the RSP to help it to grow. And then when we take that out in our later years, we are shifting down. So we're time shifting, tax sheltering, and then tax, sh uh, tax shifting downward. The last thing that I have here is, is a, uh, a comment on, uh, on RSP loans. Uh, be aware, I'm not going to go into this in detail. I'm going to let Amy uh, step back in here. Be aware that when you take an RSP loan, there is no deduction for the interest charges on the RSP loan, and eventually you do have to pay back that loan. Nonetheless, if you're trying to get things going with your RSP savings, having an RSP loan that you have a serious commitment to pay back as soon as possible, and certainly within the year that you take that loan, then it can get your RSP going a little bit faster. You can give a, a little bit of a boost and then get yourself into some kind of a regular contribution during the year to make your RSP contributions. And that way you won't be depleted by the interest on having to borrow money to get into your RSP. You'll be more efficient using your own money during the course of the year to get the money into the RSP regularly. And then off you go, you keep on accumulating. So Amy, I'm gonna let you step back in here and uh, see if we've got questions that have come up. Um, yeah, that's about it. Okay. Up to you. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much, Doug. So yes, we'll open it up for questions now. Um, you can use the chat to put your questions in there. Um, and maybe while the participants kind of think about what they'd like to ask or type away, um, I'll start with one if that's okay, Doug. So sure. maybe a common question, something that uh, I heard quite often during my time as an advisor is sometimes a lot of our members or clients ask, you know, should I put extra money towards my mortgage? Should I put extra money towards my retirement savings? And so love to just hear your perspective on, on that question to, to kick us off. Okay, well, I, I, I would certainly recommend to, to have a conversation with your advisor, <laughs> that's you, uh, about, uh, about the personal, the, the actual numbers that are involved and, and, uh, and look at it in greater detail. As a principle, though, <laughs> I, I'd be inclined to skewing more of, not necessarily doing all, but skewing more of the dollars towards knocking down the, the debts that you have than to doing retirement savings because the cost it's one it's inescapable it's known what the cost is on your your mortgage amount and so in order to to do as well on the investment savings in uh whatever the, the places you're doing it but in your rsp you've got your comparative of the the cost of the interest charge which you have to earn money then you be taxed on it, then you pay your interest charges, and of course you have to pay your principal back on your mortgage. So you need to get a rate of return which is higher on your investment savings than the rate which you are paying on your debts. I'm not gonna start, start trying to play with, with a, personal's, a person's tax rates, but it, it, is, it is very unlikely that on a consistent basis, you can make a greater rate of return on your, your retirement savings than you're gonna be charged on the, the amounts that you are, are having to pay on your mortgage. Now, I've made this, this comment, many people have made this comment, consistency over the years. 
And it was always, oh, sure, that's what you say. Back for the last decade or so, when interest rates were like this small and mortgage rates uh, accordingly were this small. Well, in the last two years, a lot of people are probably looking at that and going, oh, if I had knocked down my mortgage that much more significantly over the years while still saving to, I'm not saying again, all of it, but with the extra dollars beyond what you've already committed that you're going to put into your retirement savings, if you were to focus your attention skewing that towards knocking down the mortgage, then as unfortunate as it may have been if you were in a variable rate mortgage where you were paying 2% uh, two years ago and then you renewed at somewhere around 6 or 7%, then you probably would be saying to yourself, oh, I'm glad that I knocked down the principal over the course of the last five years so that though the interest charges are higher, they're higher on a smaller amount because I have less principal to pay back. So that's generally my, my approach to it. Do, do both, but with the excess dollars, getting rid of the mortgage is going to make you feel much more comfortable. And for myself, I'll say that this on, on a personal level, I did really significantly skew towards getting rid of the mortgage. And then uh, we, we picked it up on the retirement savings thereafter. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for that. Uh, there is a question in the chat here, Doug. So Victoria asks, can I keep my RRSP if I move out of the country? Uh, yeah, you can, you can keep your RRSP. You can't contribute any more into it. Uh, if you are a non-resident, not just if you were physically out for a little while, but if you if you actually have cut ties with Canada and you're treated as a non-resident for tax purposes, then the amounts coming out of your RSP will be taxable and Canada will withhold based on the non-resident withholding tax rate, which, uh, Amy, you can check me on this. <laughs> I think it's 25 percent. I'll stop my practice. I think it's 25 percent is the uh, is the withholding rate. So it's it's not that you can then get it out tax free. Uh, but you you being a non-resident can keep your RSP in place. And then when you start drawing down on it, then the taxes will apply uh, at that time. And uh, and if you come back to Canada, then it's back up and available to you as it was before you cross the border in the exit direction. Come back in. OK, good to know. Good to know. I love that that question is being asked as we approach winter in Saskatchewan. So maybe folks <laughs> have plans to head somewhere else. But Okay, thank you, Doug. So uh, as we come to the end here, I don't see any other questions, so I will wrap us up. So, you know, huge thank you, Doug, for joining us today and taking the time to educate, you know, our members, clients, our, our employees. Uh, and thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. A couple of quick reminders um, as we head to the end here that um, you will receive an email uh, from myself. Uh, after attending this survey, which is a feedback uh, survey. So would really appreciate it if you'd take the time to provide feedback to us as we have some more sessions coming up, and that is always important. And when you registered, if you did give your consent, uh, you'll also receive an email from a financial advisor with Connexus or Thrive. Um, with some handouts about the information that was shared today as Doug referenced. And if you didn't give us consent, uh, but you'd like to still receive the handouts, you can absolutely just pop your name into the chat right now and we will add you to the list. And then finally, of course, if you have any questions or you want to start the next steps into your retirement planning or continue your retirement planning, please make sure that you reach out to your financial advisor. If you have a financial advisor with Connexus or Thrive, of course. Um, and if not, I'm just going to put up the uh, contact information here for our um, contact center, of course, with Connexus so that you can reach out to our member contact center uh, and get in touch with someone directly so that we can help you with those next steps. So again, just a huge thank you to everyone today for your time. Thank you to Doug for joining us. We look forward to the next ones coming up that you can also see on the screen here. And we hope to see you again when we host those sessions. Thank you so much.